Uh, welcome to the, again, thanks to the Wilson Center uh, Cinema Roundtable. Uh, thanks to Dave Marr, who will be organizing this all along, a good friend. Uh, we also want to thank Nicholas Allen, uh, director, Winnie Smith, and Lloyd Winstead, who's been with me doing many, many years of this. Um, and thank you all for registering for this event. We do it on Friday afternoons. Typically, every semester, at least once, we'll have a cinema roundtable. We use 4 o'clock Friday in part because there are very few course conflicts. We can usually get a big room, which doesn't matter anymore. Um, so unfortunately, we're not up in the balcony uh, today as well. Um, but generally, every semester, I have been for over 20 years now, we've been organizing cinema roundtables and discussions. Um, and usually, there, we find something that's cross disciplinary that's going to be interest students, staff, and faculty, hopefully. Um, so, we go from a wide range of topics. Um, so, for this fall's event, uh, I wanted to deal with something that was very cinematic um, to remind us of the joys of going to movies and seeing things on a big screen and things we had hopefully seen on a big screen before. Uh, it's a nostalgic venture, I admit. Um, but uh, Dunkirk, when it premiered, of course, um, uh, taught a lot of people, the average viewers, about aspect ratios and things they had to read about. When 1917 came out, uh, spectators suddenly were curious about long takes and steady cams and deep space. And so, and so both these stories led to discussions of storytelling and style within the World War II genre uh, as well. Um, and they told it in new creative ways. So I thought, what better way to talk about these movies than to get the two best people in the world to tell about, talk about storytelling and film style uh, than Kristen Thompson and David Bordwell. So I just really am thrilled that they're willing to join us for this conversation today for a special kind of event um, to talk about these two movies and other, other war movies that, that certainly will come up. Um, so I can't give these two amazing scholars the kinds of introductions they deserve, uh, or we wouldn't have time to talk about the movies. Let's just say that they're very well known, obviously, for their exemplary textbooks, film art, and film history, uh, both here used, used here at UGA and across the country. Um, but they also each have an array of important and fascinating books on many topics in film theory, film history, film criticism, but it all leads back to storytelling. Uh, that's really at the, at the, at the heart of their, um, their missions in, in many ways. Um, I should also say that Kristen is also a very accomplished Egyptologist. So they both have books on things like Eisenstein. They both have books on script writing in Hollywood, uh, as well as uh, individual uh, specific books on other topics. So we welcome you. Wish you were here in person in Athens. Uh, Kathy and Sophie and I wish we could have you to dinner tonight, like we have many times in the past. Uh, but welcome and thank you very much for coming out today. Um, they both, for everybody to know, they've both been on campus a number of times giving talks. Kristen packed the MLC once to talk about uh, uh, about um, Lord of the Rings, um, and David's been here a number of times as well. And I'll go by first names. We're good old friends. I hope that's all right not to say professor all the time. Uh, we've been we've been friends for many 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 years. So um, what we want to do is get going again. Welcome everybody. Um, and uh, Dave, if you notice, whether I don't hadn't, didn't see before, if Tanine Allison from Emory might be joining us. She's written on war books and might have some comments a little bit uh, later as well. So um, to get going, I would just like to sort of see, I know why I was interested, uh, ask David and Kristen to say a little something about the war film as genre uh, and what, what's of interest to us, uh, to us today about the, the film and its these films in their context a little bit, um, or really any aspect uh, you want to get started with. So why war movies and suspense or why? Um... Do you want to go ahead? No, OK, go ahead. Kristen says I should or go what ahead. What conventions? Okay, so, so what's interesting to me is that, I mean, if you think of, a, su suspense is something that's characteristic for all storytelling, of course. But when we, over the years, we've come to think of a suspense film as one where the tenor, the emotional through line of the film is dominated by suspense, a continuous tension with Hitchcock probably as a prototype or, or a movie like Speed or something like that. And so to reconceive the war film, I think, as a suspense film is something that's kind of characteristic of modern filmmaking. I say this because I think a lot of classic war films tend to be um, uh, rather episodic. I think this is true of films from America, but also in, in other cultures where moments of tension, moments of suspense are bracketed by sort of downtime or things that are uh, moments of character revelation, moments of reverie, moments of recalling the home front. So there's a kind of episodic structure with suspense episodes built in, but other things going on as well. 
And one of the striking things I think about these two films is that they've decided, the filmmakers have decided in both cases to create a kind of pure trajectory of suspense throughout the entire film uh, without those extra materials. So you can argue on the one hand, that's a loss because those sort of vignettes of battlefront life that you get in a classic war film where you have characterization, you start to develop the relationships between the soldiers. Uh, you also get a uh, backstory about the characters. You get exposition about their, their past and what, what brought them there. Uh, you might in a film like say The Thin Red Line have episodes of flashbacks where the flashbacks show us the home front or show us uh, someone thinking about their lives before the war. All those things get stripped away in these two films by and large. And what we get instead is just these pure trajectories of what we might call suspense situations, where it's just a series of threats, risks, danger, and so on, imminent violent action are piled up and cascade along with some breathing space, it's true at moments, but those moments are typically there only to accentuate the next thrust, the momentum of the overall suspense arc of the movie. Now that seems to me a kind of a modern way to think about war pictures. It means that you lose a lot of the other ancillary appeals of the war film. Uh, mo the moments, for instance, where characters in classic war films usually think about why they're there and what they comment on the war, they have different opinions about the war, about the suffering of war. Those kinds of things get shorter shrift in these films. That I think makes them interesting to study for that purpose of kind of a, a stage or of change or development within the genre. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And, and actually, um, I know for Kristen's work as well, but for both of you, that whole notion of sort of delayed exposition is something you've written about on all kinds of different movies. Um, and so you mentioned that, yeah, a lot of times there's all that characterization at the beginning of a number of different films to show, especially war movies often have people in the States coming from different groups and yep. different parts of the country who have to get used to each other. Uh, and, and all those expectations, you're right, that's been stripped away is a good way of putting it. Um, so yeah, do you want to say anything about the, is, is exposition interesting in these films in terms of of bits and pieces of characterization? Um, does it fit war conventions or not? Well, I wouldn't have said that uh, Dunkirk has much in the way of an opening exposition. I mean, it's just, it, it launches right in. I, I think I, I, it would be interesting to go back and figure out where this idea of nonstop action comes from because Saving Private Ryan might be uh, a good example of something where it just launches in and it, it is episodic, but uh, there's suspense all the way through it. Uh, whereas if you look back at some of the classic films that David was mentioning, something like They Were Expendable, which I think is one of the great war films, 1945, John Ford, um, that starts out very slowly and you think it's almost going to be a comedy. You've got, uh, yeah. you know, a bunch of guys and they're, you know, there's the usual John Ford humor. And then suddenly, of course, the Japanese invade Pearl Harbor and you've got a sort of slow buildup of a set of episodes leading to the battles. But it's really, you, you would almost mistake what kind of a film it was uh, for the first portion of it. And something like The Big, uh, the Big Parade from 1925, the first third of the film is just this, you know, the guy's billeted at a farmhouse and Jim, the hero, falling in love with Melisande, the, uh, you know, the farmer's daughter. And it's, uh, <laughs> It then switches very suddenly into the war and the, you know, uh, three main characters who have never been in battle before are suddenly walking through a wood with snipers shooting at them. So, you know, the, you do have uh, a sense of a, a tradition in which there is a slow build up to the battlefront and the, the suspense. Yeah, I think exposition is, is it's interesting in war films because one of the things I noticed in looking at 40s war films from my book in the 40s was, in a way, the war film was an interesting development uh, in narrative technique because it allowed for what we might call multiple protagonists. Not that all battlefront films have multiple protagonists. Sometimes it's a single character going through an experience. But, but a lot of times in these films, it's hard to say who the protagonist is. It's usually several characters playing a protagonist role at different points in the movie. I mean, you can make the argument about they were expendable having two protagonists. And there are war films with three, like three comrades. But there's also a sense that in a way, as, the, as in the 40s anyway, as these things got developed, the exposition got farmed out to lots and lots of different characters because they've got so many different 
characters playing momentarily sort of micro protagonist roles. At certain scenes, this character is the leading figure and then he might get killed or might just become subordinate to something else. So you get these dollops of exposition, you know, spread through the movie to kind of enhance our investment, I think, in those particular characters that are gonna play the protagonist role. These films, the two films we're talking about are interesting because on the one hand, I think most of us think it's gonna be a dual protagonist film at the beginning in 1917. And then it turns out pretty much fairly soon, like half an hour or so into it, to become a single protagonist film. And then the other films, uh, the other film of uh, Dunkirk has multiple tag protagonists, I guess you would say, or kind of a se several more or less equivalent main characters. And that then divides our sympathies. But again, interestingly enough, exposition goes by the board. There's very little background, particularly Farrier, the, the uh, RAF pilot. He's just yeah. a pilot. I mean, there's, there's no backstory for this guy. Uh, so I mean, that's true. He doesn't even have a photograph of like some, you know, his mama or a girlfriend back home in yeah, his cockpit. No, He's got it, nothing with no, no photo for him. Picture, nothing. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true, and it's it's true of most of the others too. Although I suppose um, the, uh, the 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 captain of the ship, uh, yeah. the little ship. Uh, he, of course, has a, he's lost his son in the war, and he has an investment in this that, that gives him some backstory. But again, interestingly enough, Nolan drops that bit of exposition in very casually when he has his son tell the shivering soldier, oh, well, you know, we lost you know, a member of our family. That's just sort of dumped in well, quite a ways into the film. So in a way, even there, they're, both films are very sparing on that kind of exposition. What exposition we get, I guess, in 1917, you might say, is enough because we do have the sense that they're both about home, those films. And so in a sense, Will, the character who seems to be most alienated from his home, kind of comes to accept and realize that, that, that that's important to him. So there's a kind of mini character arc, I suppose, there, but it's given the very- He doesn't story. want to go home ever, you know, I hate being home, et cetera. Right. So that actually <laughs> negative- but it's very sketchy compared to what you get in a more traditional war film, I think. Right. Well, well again, I think Saving Private Ryan is an example of um, the same kind of thing. And again, maybe a model for subsequent war films, but you get very little exposition about those characters either. I mean, you, you eventually find out that the Tom Hanks character is married, but that again is well into the film. And, um, That's certainly. true. They even play with exposition by what's his job. They have to bet on it, right? Like what they don't yeah, know where, what he did before this. That's right. It delays it, yeah. that information. Huh. Good point. But overall, I mean, I think that one of the fascinating reasons to study genres is um, to study them as different options for storytelling technique, because in each genre, there's some, going to be a baseline that make it a recognizable, understandable movie by, you know, Hollywood standards. But each genre tries to experiment a little bit, and both of these films obviously are experiments in those directions with, within the genre, but also experiments in more general narrative strategies. No, that's true. And before we actually talk about the individual films and some of their storytelling strategies, as you say, uh, I mean, I just have an impression, I don't know if anybody else does, that both of these films seem, even though there's a lot of effects and, and stuff, and we can, we'll, we'll talk about that, but they also sort of try to in, reinforce their own authenticity, uh, whether it's through long takes or whether it's through, um, I mean, a, a sense, at least, you know, Nolan film that you've got like, you know, lots of real people on a real beach uh, kind of notions. So there's like some, they, they seem to want to be more authentic and a little less generic. Uh, both in their storytelling. Hence, they've got two really different plot structures. Mm -hmm. uh, one with the overlapping time and the other one trying to be one linear uh, chronology uh, as well. So when Michael Mann was visiting us a couple summers ago, he really likes Nolan's films and he liked uh, Dunkirk quite a lot. And he said, I could feel the bake light in the, um, uh, in the cockpit. I mean, he thought that what was so interesting about it was these kind of very fine grain moments of pure physical realism, mm. which of course he, Michael Mann is also interested in. But I mean, the idea that Nolan had gone to, to such trouble to create the textures of these spaces, in the, particularly in the ships and the, uh, the, the aircraft, he thought was part of that authenticity. And it's something you don't get, I mean, it was practical effects. It, what, you don't do that digitally. You get it by actually having this physical stuff to be photographed. Yeah, that's a good point. No, that's great. Yeah, they, I think they're both striving to be incredibly tactile, not just about the, you know rats and blood and stuff like right. that, um, but also yeah, temperature and, and the water and, and, yeah. and oil in the water and things like oil that. Oil, that you, yeah. yeah, you feel like not only are these guys you know desperate, but they're grimy and slimy and oily and desperate. Uh, but you're right, the, the texture as well. And I don't know if you before, we should talk about the time structures certainly now, 
But um, I didn't know if you had any observations also just about the sound of these movies. Um, you guys are both pretty good at, uh, I don't know about the, 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 the different um, soundscapes they create as well with that sort of heart pounding uh, music yeah. and also that's kind of thoughtful stuff. But, um, but trying to figure out what, what sound, what music composition goes with these authentic looking uh, films is also a, a big subjective. Uh, yeah, I mean, it. it's coincidental, you know, uh, uh, Tom Schoen is a very good critic, I think, has just published this book on, oops, I'm sorry, <laughs> folks. <lost> <laughs> My moment of product placement just vanished here. Oh, there go. It, it, it did there. disappear. Anyway. Oh, can't see it. it. Can't, can't see it, are you? I think you oh. better just... Yeah. Kristen. There it is. Okay. The title is The Nolan Variations. It was just published on Tuesday. He has a very wow. good analysis of the soundtrack of mm -hmm. Dunkirk in this book, where he, okay. uh, Nolan, Nolan went to a lot of trouble to have the noise, and he's done this before. I mean, if you know Interstellar, he's done this before. Uh, the noises, the physical sound effects become a kind of music. They merge with the music so that the rhythm of the, the, rhythm of the boats is, is like the rhythm of the music and so forth. They went to a lot of trouble to make these sounds all one big audio, audio mix, you know. And that's, I think, very effective in that film. I guess I would have said, not having studied it, I guess I would have said 1917 has a more traditional orchestral yeah. Yeah. soundtrack. Yeah, and I, I think rather an aggressive one. I found it kind of very noticeable. Yes. Yeah. It was, you know. No, that's very true. I up the tension. Yeah, yeah it's, it's almost like they're going to try to reinforce the rhythm they don't get with editing by having by the music no. to sort of guide your attention no. in some way. It's a nudging, nudging factor, yeah, it seems. Also, I think there's a way in which you have to command people's attention. When you're not cutting, you have to find ways to make sure people look at the right stuff. And sometimes that's given through the framing, of course, the way the camera moves, the way the figures move. But sometimes it's given through sound. And sometimes it's given through even dialogue. Like there's that moment when they crawl over the lip of the hill and one of them says, um, oh, look, there's a gap in the wire. And so you look beyond them and you can see the gap in the wire. So, I mean, the soundtrack is constantly, I think, uh, nudging us to notice certain things because you don't have a cut in or a camera zoom or something like that that would accentuate the point they want to make. That's a good point. No, that's terrific. And it's, since you mentioned plot, product placement and it was within reach here with many of your books, just um, and, and uh, David just mentioned the 40s, uh, his 40s book, Reinventing Hollywood, uh, is the, um, the most, is, is one of his most recent books. He's also got a book on uh, 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 that you can get through their website. I should have mentioned the, the website, which is on the yeah. Wilson Center site, uh, their blog site, um, and that also has a book on Christopher Nolan. So yeah. that uh, you've read. But we haven't seen Tenet yet. I mean, because you can't go to the theater. Right. But it's coming out on DVD in December, right? Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. You would know. I. No, I just found that out. Yeah. I'm, I'm not it's, sure. It's okay. scheduled to come out in December. Okay. Like the 15th, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So well, the, we should talk about the time structure a bit um, and certainly plot structure. There are a lot of students from both in, uh, intro classes here, uh, but people, anybody who's looked at uh, if the film art book knows it's built around plot versus story uh, to, to a great extent. Uh, and storytelling choices. So should we say, talk a little about uh, about those. I don't know who wants to, um, or special effects, whatever, whatever Kristen or David you wanna go to next. Well, uh, I, I'd like to read a little quote here from uh, Mendes because I think uh, the, the, uh, the whole justification for trying to do this in real time, even though it's obviously far from real time, but uh, is this idea of emotional immersion, which I presume has a lot to do with suspense, but here's what he says he was trying to do. I had this thought, why don't we lock the audience into the men's experience in a way that feels completely unbroken? In a movie that resembles a ticking clock thriller in which we experience every second passing in real time, Mendes says, it, seems like, it seemed like a natural way of telling the story, albeit difficult. So, um, this idea that being constantly with the characters every second, he says, um, for this trip is uh, immersion. And yet, of course, I think um, I think uh, Nolan really wants immersion too, and he gets it through this this, this very very fast cutting around the different people, all in suspenseful situations at the same time, and going away from them. Uh, which builds up your curiosity, curiosity about what's going on when you're not with those characters and you switch to another one. Um, 
But I thought maybe we could show the clip that uh, I talked about from, um, from 1917, which has actually a cut that's very obvious and a long ellipsis. Uh, so this idea that is always referred to in the literature on the film, that this is one shot is, is just not true. And it's kind of an interesting point at which he uh, inserts this long ellipsis. So if we can show that, that would sure. be great. That's the entering the building, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh. And well, I, will t I will warn, I mean, it is, for, especially for people who haven't seen the film, it's a little, there's, it's a little dark. Um, and in fact, I'm going right from a, from a DVD because it'll look as... as uh, uh, I should probably say just a, something about to set up what's going do. on. Um, this is a scene about midway through the film. Uh, the main character is alone at this point and he's just crossed a bridge and a sniper has been um, shooting at him. So he goes into this building and um, confronts the sniper. Everybody can see that? Dave, you can see it? Um, start one second here for me. Um, yeah, yeah, was, dark. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. It's a bit dark, but uh, what happens is he he's been an unconscious. He wakes up and he checks his watch, which of course sort of calls attention to the fact that we're supposed to be in real time, and yet we've just had an ellipsis that takes you from daylight to nighttime. Uh, we never find out exactly how much time has passed, but it's got to be hours. And right. at the beginning of the film, they say it's going to take them eight to nine hours to get out to the battalion they're trying to save and deliver their message. Um, I think we see them actually moving uh, from place to place for maybe an hour of the film total. I mean, there's a long section where they stay at a, a ruined farm uh, for, I would think, maybe 10 minutes. Um, it's, it's not real time. Uh, that's, that's uh, you know, the impression that you get from all the uh, trade paper reviews and, and uh, making of kinds of articles, but it's not at all a real time. It's a, it's a compressed uh, sort of illusion of time. And I think that's, um, it's interesting to note that, you know, because this was sold so much on this idea of, of this continuous, you know, real time, 
uh, the film is, well, if you take the credits off, it's about um, 110 minutes maybe. So um, it's, it's a, an artificial suspense build up through this kind of um, one shot illusion. Mm -hmm. Mm. Right. So and a couple of things here are occurring to me. One is the, uh, the idea that, you know, Mendes has also talked about this idea of immersion that Kristen mentioned as a kind of participation. Um, he had said that he, because he watched his kids play video games, and the first person shooter video game didn't exactly give him the idea for the film, but he thought that maybe young people could plug into the film based on their experiences of that kind of continuous first person engagement. Uh, the other thing that Kristen mentions is I think right because so many of these films that we think of as long take quote real time films do rely on on compression and think of rope for instance supposedly there's no time left out and rope has eight shots but nevertheless it's supposedly all in continuous time but it's not there's lots of things go on off screen and you know it becomes late afternoon to late evening in 80 minutes or something like that 90 minutes so clearly a lot of this relies on a very theatrical convention is that when things are off screen times passes faster <laughs> you can have people leave and go across town and come back in 10 minutes of stage time, which would take an hour in story time, you know, that sort of thing. So there's always that level, I think, of artifice and compression that Kristen was yeah, talking yeah. about. Even yeah, and especially the, just before the scene that, that we just showed that Kristen was talking about, he's in that truck with some people for a while. I mean, he yeah. has time to have like one little sip of whiskey or something yeah. and talk a little about why he's out there. And then boom, he gets let off. And then after this, actually, the, right after that, when this guy wakes up and realizes, oh my God, it's night and looks out the window, like the camera kind of comes through, comes down, and what it looks like is this his point of view shot or he's imagined and then suddenly he kind of walks into his own point walks of view in, shot, like yeah. he got out of the building magically mighty fast mighty fast yeah right yeah so no no it's uh, as opposed to as yeah. opposed to dunkirk with uh with yeah. a, a very different conception of time um, well, I, see, I, I didn't know oh, david if you want to talk about the time in dunkirk that, that, yeah because i find it I, I, we wrote about it as you say in a little book we did uh, we published ourselves but i wish now i'd done more with this it's a fascinating idea because again in this tom Schoen book Nolan says that his wife, the co-producer of the film, said, oh, this is an art movie disguised as a mainstream movie. And Nolan says, no, it's a mainstream movie disguised as an art movie. <laughs> and I think there's an interesting duality to the film that I don't think I recognized before. But now that I see it, at one level, there's this appeal of geek uh, complexity. That is, you've got three time frames. They run concurrently, but they're different slices of time. And what they're nested within each other. So one hour is nested within one day, is nested within one week. And we're, they're sort of chronological, but we get them uh, unfolding and, and intersecting in different ways. And that's a complex, maybe overcomplicated kind of structure. But there's, it's got the same kind of appeal, I think, that Memento had. Remember when Memento came out, a lot of people said, I can't wait till this comes out on DVD so I can really get to work on it. You know, <laughs> there's this idea, it's like homework or something like that. And I think there's that element in this film too, like, okay, let me lay this sucker out, see how it all fits together. But there's another level, and Nolan and his editor have, have mentioned this saying, look, you can enjoy this film without trying to figure out the time frames because the situations are so compelling. There's this immediate and direct cascade of suspense scenarios you know one thing you have to jump across a plank you have to get out from underwater three times you know you got all these different things immediately grabbing you and those things compel people to just keep just take what they're given just go with it you know and the actual way in which they all interlock is something that's there for another level of appreciation or connoisseurship even but for just general engagement it's a, it, you know, you've just got all these suspenseful, tension-filled situations. And I think that's fascinating because that means the film has really got two levels of address. You can enjoy it as this thriller like Speed or something like that. Or at another level, you can say, this is actually a kind of experimental film. That's the art film, I guess, aspect of it. So that seems to me, you know, if you think about like the two films, I tend to think of them, what Mendes seems to be going for is a kind of tapestry, a kind of unrolling, you know, Whereas what Nolan is going for is a kind of mosaic, uh, a, a, a cubistic mosaic, because we're coming at it from different angles. But the idea of all these little fragments, which you kind of sweep up and try to make sense of, fortunately you can do it because they're very generic. The situations are very generic. The characters just go with the situation. So it's not difficult, 
But at another level, if you actually want to see how the whole thing is put together, you have to uh, kind of think about it or take it home and study it. It's a pretty interesting idea about, about modern movies, particularly because modern movies, because you can see them again and again on DVD or on streaming or whatever, encourage a kind of recidivism, I think, in audiences. And that means filmmakers can make them more intricate. The films can be more complicated because they know that people are okay with not getting everything on the first pass. I mean, so many people said, I guess they're mostly fans, but nevertheless said, oh, I'm gonna see Tenet two, three, four times. They just plan to do it, you know, it's like fan duty. So there's a sense in which nowadays films can have these kinds of sort of multiple points of entry because of the fact that people can take home movies and study them, which they couldn't do in the classic studio system era. You saw the movie and a week later it was gone. Yeah, you've got a couple good, I mean, one of the points about that notion of anybody can watch for anything, it's like there's that moment when uh, the second pilot is at Collins is, is trying to get out of his cockpit, water's pouring into his cockpit, and then you cut to water pouring into the tub where Tommy and the French guy are trying. So it, yeah, it doesn't matter like what time was that water yep. versus this, yep. each person at risk, it, it, you just cut from almost like a graphic match of water pouring into both of them. And they're both very primal situations, like an eight-year-old kid gets that, right? That's completely <laughs> clear. Yeah. As opposed to the, the repetition, I don't know about other people, but the first time watching watching Dunkirk, I'm like, how many guys are there we're following? It, they all, it was that the same guy over and over? They had so many people who looked the same, these soldiers, they, you know, dark oh. hair and anyway. It, and the it was just hard to, put, hard to figure put, out, is that still Tommy? Is that another guy who looks like him? Anyway. Or putting, um, putting, well, that know. happens in war films a lot. I mean, you look at, yeah. say, Thin Red Line, those guys all look the same. It's amazing. And their voices are like floating over these pictures of guys, unshaven, dark haired, dark eyed guys, you know, in their helmets. They're almost interchangeable. But here it's interesting because I think what you're saying is interesting because the ways in which the characters, uh, I mean, he muffles the characters. He loves to put Tom Hardy, you know, in swaddling clothes, you know, poor Tom Hardy in this in the Batman movie, you know, just like, like this. I mean, there's all kinds of ways he kind of, you know, pushes you a little bit about these char about characterization in these films. Okay, did you want to show that clip or should we move on to other Yeah, okay, time? this is what I would say about what's- It's up to I, you. This is the experimental side because at one, he kind of fakes you out in the clip that I picked because you've got Dawson running the Moonstone, his little pleasure craft, and then you've got the arrival of the little ships at Dunkirk and the way they're intercut, it makes it seem like he's one of them. But of course they're not, they're still way the hell out at sea. They're picking up Collins, you know? And so, but the way he's intercut them, he brings them together as part of this larger initiative to rescue the people on the mole. But at the same time, he's distinct and separate because he's got his own mission, which is to bring back and eventually the people who have been thrown off the exploded tanker. So, I mean, the intercutting has these kind of almost poetic or associative resonances, even though each little story is plowing ahead in its own you know, chronology. So yeah, let's run that clip because it's quite okay, interesting. Sure. And while we do this, Dave, is this an okay time for you to like make it so that guests can uh, can can unmute themselves to talk? And actually, after we show this this clip, maybe Tanine, I don't, I see you now in the corner. So if Tanine, if you want want to say a few words about why you're interested in it, she's she's been writing about these uh, these films as well, and has a whole book about uh, the spectacle, basically, of war films. Uh, so okay, I'll share I'll share a screen a clip. It's about four. It's about five minutes, maybe. Uh, yeah. And then we'll come back and and have have some good discussion. How's that? That's good. Again, give me a second to make sure I get the right thing here. Again, I'm running it off of the DVD clip because I think it looks a little better uh, and sounds a little better than embedding it digitally. What do you see?
Is he all right, the boy? No. No, he's not. Pause here now because we have more time for talking. Okay, sure. And there are men in the water. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, this is the, the rest of the scene is the convergence of the three storylines, but I it would okay. take too long, I think. But the main point I want to make was that he is able to juggle between these storylines, repeat certain things. I mean, if you assume that, you know, there, there aren't really flashbacks as such, but there are in a way because the storylines are attached to different points of view, different character viewpoints. So if when we're with the boat, we have a chronology, but we all, with the pilot in the air, they have an, a chronology, but they, over, they are um, staggered, I guess I should say. They're sort of en décalage, you know, they're off, off center. And so that's why you can have Farrier at the very end of the film land the plane, that beautiful shot of the plane just coasting there. Yeah. Um, which is that night, but of course that takes place much before the things that we see in Weymouth and in the uh, in the train and things like that. And yet that's the end of the film. So there's still this kind of like offset among the different storylines that brings them all to a conclusion, but in a different in different intervals. And that's I think is again something that has that dual address I was talking about because if you just get the general sense of all this conclusion, all these disclosure, that's enough. But if you want to see the sort of the time gaps and so forth in, in more detail, you can do that too. No, that's good. And, 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 and again, I, oh, go ahead, Kristen. One thing I noticed watching it again this time was that in the first half of the film, there's a very careful systematic cycling among the three stories. So you start with the mole, you go to the sea, and then you go to the air. And that happens every time you, um, it changes scenes. You, know, you go back to the mole, you go back to the sea, you go back to the air. And then about halfway through, he stops doing that. So he gets you accustomed to having these three. Mm. And at least that gives you some kind of handle for the point at which he starts cutting much more freely among them. That's true. And there's more, there seems to be more sound overlap too. So this, this yeah. notion that you, you hear the men cheering on the beach yes. and, then you, and then you see poor Cillian down there, you know, the shivering soldier, you know, he's not cheering. And then, you know, oh, there's men in the water and you cut to men in the water. And just to remind people, yeah, after this, yeah, you get Farrier shooting, uh, shooting at the plane that's bombed them. Then you see the uh, Tommy coming up out of his tub getting shot at. And he sees the thing get shot, get blown up that we just saw. So yeah, it's, it does bring them all closer and closer together. But right, then there's that big shift uh, back to when does he actually get to the land because he's got almost no gas. It's not like he can be flying around for another hour. Right. So that's, that's, that's great. Um, so is it okay if we ask Tanin for any, is that all right, sure. Tanin? Do I, can I put you on the spot? Um, so Tanin is also, she's works on war films. Uh, she's written about uh, Dunkirk in her new book uh, and also apparently in a new article talking about uh, 1917 as well. So, so what, what would you, why are you interested in these films? And what, what appeals to you about what, what's of interest for how you work on, on cinema to talk about these war films? Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to respond, Richard. And hello to uh, Professors Boardwell and Professor Thompson. Um, I, in my book, wrote about World War II films and include, included a chapter on video games. So as soon as Dunkirk came out, I was immediately thinking, this is like a video game. You feel like you're there. There's this manipulation of time and this really intense um, feeling of sensation in your body that you are there and that, you know, there's all of these things that play into the suspense narrative of like, are they going to drown? You know, they're about to drown and not, you know, all, all of these um, obstacles that they have to face just one thing after another. And it really made me feel like a video game. And then of course, when I saw 1917, I had 
a very similar reaction because that's the sort of the first person shooter a uh, similar kind of point of view, even though it's not it's not really first person, but it is that long, ex extended long take, seemingly. Um, and re yeah, yeah, like applies. like subjective experience. So I was trying to think about you know how to to understand these films in relationship to some video games that came out recently, Call of Duty World War II and Battlefield One, which re returned the first person shooter genre to historical wars and were at least Battlefield One was very well regarded and popular, Call of Duty World War II less so. Um, what I, one thing I noticed there is that the video games were not doing very much with storytelling or with gameplay. It was sort of the same kind of thing that you would expect from a Battlefield or Call of Duty game but they were actually doing some different things with representation where they were including women characters and characters of different races. And so to compare that then with um, 1917 and Dunkirk, they have both been criticized uh, for their depictions of an all white, all male war, which was not accurate, even though it, you know, obviously the vast majority of people who fought in World War One and World War Two, in these instances that they're talking about, were white men. They still didn't take any effort to include. I mean, are there any women in these movies? I can't remember. Maybe there's a there's a few well, no, shots. There's, there's you got Lori, Lori, who's taking care of a baby. Um, well, it's a hospital not her own. The hospital. Nineteen seventeen. Yeah. Uh, so a little bit. Aren't yeah. there aren't there members of the British Empire in the truck? I yeah. mean, it seems like there's some colonials. In yeah, the, and they complain it's not even their country. You know, I, we don't even yeah. live here, and you know, we got to be I mean, shot it, at. It's very sparse, for sure. But it's, but it is, very it's, sparse. It's a small yeah. Part. Yeah, and so you know, I, I think that they both received some criticism once they were uh, nominated for Best Picture, and particularly when uh, the Academy changed its requirements for diversity. There was a lot of headlines like, "Will movies like 1917, you know, no longer be allowed or no longer be nominated because it's all all white men?" Um, so I was just I was trying to think about that relationship, and that's still something I'm trying to work out. It's interesting. But I, it's it, interesting it makes me wonder. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just want to say it's interesting that Tenet he chose an African American for his protagonist. Yeah, and I haven't seen that one either yet. But it, you know, it just makes me wonder, like, were they focused so much on these storytellings and this, these perceptual techniques that they didn't have the, the bandwidth to, to imagine a new kind of person? Or is, you know, is there something about the fact that it was so invested in bodies that they could only imagine it being invested in the white male body, which is often understood to stereotypically to be sort of universal standing in for or able to stand in for absolutely anybody so you can imagine yourself as that soldier rather than you know it being a particular experience trying to make it a universal corporeal experience so those are the uh, kinds of things I'm thinking about. I don't know to what extent segregation was operative in the British Army this period maybe there's some historians among us who can say um, but uh, we do see at, um, some black soldiers in both films, I believe, but I know, but they're not very salient, and I assume they're colonials. So I don't know to what extent you know the American services were, as you know from your research, was were segregated, and I don't know to what extent that happened in in uh, the UK. And didn't and doesn't Mendez's film end with sort of in, in in thinking of like you know so and so who told us these stories. Um, I think there's like a person, almost like Peter Jackson with his like, <laughs> they shall not grow old, which is like, you know, he's got all those guns and he's just collecting and about his it, it, it losing family members. Um, so I think those two also, there's a certain, you know, kind of a, a personal connection um, to, as well that they see it through their families uh, and their family's bodies like theirs, I think might be part of it too. That's true. I think to me, this is another interesting point is that why, why make a movie like 1917? I mean, I mean, Nolan is, is a film nerd, so he wants to experiment with time. That's well established. But Mendes is a pretty academic director. And why someone wants to make a long take, single quote, single shot, real time movie, that's an interesting question now. I mean, I'm not sure that they're necessarily plugging into the video game aesthetic, though I think she, she's right to suggest that, that that's part of it. But I just think there's a kind of sense of 
I do it because I can. That is, uh, long takes are permissible because we have long, we have digital cinema now. We can have very long takes with digital camera, but we can also stitch things together to create the impression, like with Birdman, like me going away suddenly, very arbitrarily. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just just narrate from the hallway now. <laughs> but no, well, it's, right. um, yeah, yeah, you're right. To what extent is floor. it a gimmick? Yeah. No, I just think there's a, it's a, well, there's a kind of self congratulatory virtuosity about this. Like, yeah. it's really hard. And we did it. If you look at the press coverage of the cinematography and the, the way it was shot, boy, we never thought we could do it, but we did it. You know, this kind of prowess that people display with this kind of flashy technique. Uh, you think about Birdman the same way, right? I mean, Birdman has more shots, but it's the basic idea uh, of, you know, like, we're going to do this because it looks so cool, you know? Yeah, and, well, right. you know that uh, it's not just the first person shooter kinds of games, but they were watching Son of Saul. Uh, the yeah. Danish film, which won best foreign yeah. film, so there's a bit of prestige, and uh, it's not, you know, it's not done as a single shot or anything like that. But um, that was one of their influences. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks, Chuck. I said Chuck Malin made a comment as well. Yeah, um, so anyway, please, anyone join in the conversation, ask questions comments, of each no. other and of our. Um, uh, yeah, I had seen Chuck, Chuck down there. Um, yeah, did uh, did you guys want to take a question from Aaron Meskin? Aaron Aaron had a question about audiences just above. Oh, sure. I didn't see it. Sure. Yeah, Aaron, Aaron go ahead. You want to unmute yourself? Yeah, sure. So, David, you talked about, you emphasized the dual address of Dunkirk. So I was just wanting to get clear. Sometimes when people think of dual address, it's very typical to think of different audiences. It did sound to me like you were thinking a bit more in terms of one audience in different contexts, say first viewing versus later viewing. That oh. just put, so I just wanted to get clear on that if that's how you were thinking of it. And, and if it is the latter, then it made me think of this as the, the dual address in this latter sense, multiple audiences and uh, sorry, one audience in a different context as like a proposed solution to the, the possibility of diminishing suspense, what sometimes called the paradox of suspense. And that made me also think that maybe the intended emotional immersion of 1917 is also done that, is playing a role there. Like if people are gonna watch these a lot of times at home and the films are suspense films, you gotta give them something else. You gotta do something else. You gotta give them the, the, the puzzle, the art puzzle. Anyway, that was the just general thought I had. What, I was wondering what you thought. Those are, those are both really nice ideas, I think. Uh, on the first point, I think it could be both. I think there are some audiences uh, who love puzzle films and will go to, go to Dunkirk, not even, you know, really just as potato as a puzzle, uh, as another challenge from the Nolan mind. But I also think there's a dual level of just, it's, uh, I think that's what he's so good at putting together is action genres or engaging genres, like science fiction, the heist movie, whatever, and a kind of puzzle component that will both lure in different audiences, but will also train up maybe fan audiences to appreciate, you know, action fans say, like I guess Tenet, I can't say, but I guess Tenet is, was aimed to get some James Bond fan type fans, but at the same time to provide this kind of time zero kind of time frame. So I think it could be both. I think you could be talking about two audiences or one audience in a, you know, in a, in a different mode. But your point's well taken also about suspense and the paradox of suspense. I mean, there's a lot of ways to resolve that paradox, I think. Uh, one way is, the standard way is to say, well, if you know what's going to happen, you feel less suspense, because suspense is about not knowing. But I'm more inclined to think that there's a kind of moment of suspension of knowledge where even if you know what's going to happen, there's still a pleasure at, at unrolling it again. I mean, you think about movies like Speed, say, where, or Die Hard, where you've seen it umpteen times, and you're still revved up. There seems to be some sort of low level perceptual processes that lock in on this stuff. And music, to go back to Dick's point, music plays a big role here, I think. Music is just autonomic, you know what I mean? It just hits you right away. And that and sound, there's very little filtration to the sound pickup. And so in a way, even though you quote know at some conceptual level how this is all gonna turn out, the music, the cutting, the dynamism of the movement, the situation itself. I mean, these are very primal scenarios, it seems to me, in both cases, like, am I going to drown? Am I going to fall off a waterfall? You know, all these things. And these kind of still have a kind of a, a, a grabbing quality that uh, can't be overridden by your knowing the ultimate story arc. 
So I, I agree with you. The paradox of suspense is really relevant here, but I do think that it doesn't rule out the kind of recidivism I was talking about. Oops, we got, uh, sorry, it's hard for me to keep up on the questions here. Yeah, sorry, there, I, I guess Joe Hildreth oh. was the first question in, in the queue after that, or, or Richard, is there is there another one you've I, seen that? Oh, I, I'm just starting to look, I'm sorry, Ka I know Cash had a question and, um, oh, oh, I, give me a second there, hit the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, yeah, who? I, I mean, you can certainly push down your, your, you know, ask a question aloud, and we'll try to get to the chat ones too. Um, so who's got it? Oop, oop! I keep getting the wrong. I lost them somehow. Oh well, sorry. So who's who's got a question? Feel free to uh, you know, open your mic. I, I just somehow lost all the chats. Did you? Oh, did you? Yeah, I've I've got them, Joe. Uh, if, is that if, progressive if, ad, that progressive insurance ad, where everybody just like cross purposes? I was <laughs> feeling zoom session. I got my chat's empty suddenly. I don't know what I did. Uh, who, whoever whoever does have okay, a Parker question. Parker Myers, go ahead. Okay, go ahead and unmute yourself. You you should be. I, able uh, to. I typed this question in chat, but um, Professor Boardwell, you mentioned earlier um, the immersion of 1917 especially related to um the suspension of disbelief i believe your quote was um i don't know who you said said it but it was uh that it's a mainstream film ponising is an art house film and i thought that was interesting because i think i was and i was wondering what you think about 1917 kind of i wouldn't say parading because that's a bit of a derogatory way to phrase it but how is a film like 1917 that centralizes its visual gimmick so much supposed to authentically communicate what it's trying to say when the suspension of disbelief is kind of is tossed to the side in favor of the visual gimmick itself, especially when it relates to a war film? Yeah, I'm not so sure. I mean, I'm not prepared to go the whole immersion route and the body engagement route because I think movies are still pretty pretty stimulus de depriving of, uh, you know, I, I mean, there are a lot of cues there, but I just, uh, immersion seems to me kind of a bigger not notion. Um, and it's easy to just become applied metaphorically, I think. So I, my sense is basically um, with what, you, what you're suggesting is we suspend our disbelief in various ways, at certainly high level processes we can, but in terms of sensory input, there's a lot of cues, a lot of things that are flowing out of the screen and out of the speakers to us that do tap some pretty basic responses. So it's, I think there's always a balance between suspending disbelief. I know I'm in a theater. I know those bullets aren't going to hit me, all that stuff. But at the same time, there's a sense in which there is a strong impulse to say, that's me moving through that space behind those guys walking, or it's me in this plane dipping down over the ocean. Uh, it's always a balance. I mean, this goes back to classic film theory. Rudolf Arnheim always tried to argue that there's this cinema is not, cinema approaches certain realistic qualities, but it can never be at the 2D screen and his time, black and white, limited frame, all that stuff. We're still pretty, pretty much isolated and remote from what's going on. So there's always a balance. It's a fiction. We know it's a fiction and we have to imaginatively project ourselves into the fiction, but we need help. We need the prompting to do that. So to me, it's this balancing act between the different things you mentioned. Thank you. Uh, Matthew, uh, hello, Matthew, you got on. There he is, there's Matthew. Yes. Matthew Bernstein's there. I'm sorry, I just saw you say something and I saw you, do you have something to say or no? Oh, I keep, I keep getting the wrong button. Oh, well, okay, I just lost the chat again. I don't, I click on chats and they disappear. I don't know what I'm doing, so. I, I have a question. Okay, please, Cash. So this is uh, more about the the war film genre um, in general, and it's for anybody who feels that they, they have an answer for it. But I'm wondering if you feel that it's possible to make a war film that is truly anti-war. And if so, what would you say the distinction is between a pro-war film and an anti-war film? And I think this question might actually be related to Parker's a little bit because he mentioned the visual gimmick of 1917, <clears throat> excuse me. And it seems to me that on some level, most blockbuster war films 
are participating in some kind of jingoism or romanticism in a way. It's it's more obvious with things like American Sniper, for example. Um, and I, I find it interesting that, or I guess the question is, can a film truly be an anti-war film if it's using, it's on the supposition that it's using war's atmosphere and iconography to bring in tickets? Uh, I hope Excellent. that was a clear question. I don't know if Tanine has an answer for that too, or David and Kristen, or anybody else? Well, I think, I think Grand Illusion comes pretty close because it doesn't have a lot of battle scenes. It's about prisoners of war. And there's a lot of conversations about war and so forth, but that I think that gets away from you know the, the thrilling aspect of it. And I, I think there are probably others. Um, West Front 1918, um, Wooden crosses. There, are, there are some pretty effective anti-war films, I think, that that don't really, you know, titillate you with the the violence and the the. Uh, right, and like, it is one of the paradoxes of the war film, right? It says war is hell, but we can be heroic, you know, and it can be exhilarating, and it can be, as as Tanine says in her book, spectacular, right? Tanine, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I'd agree with Professor Thompson there that um, anytime you represent combat, you're representing the spectacle and the excitement of it, and it's going to have a visceral appeal to you. And that's gonna be exciting. And, um, you know, it, it, it probably has a hard time just in itself being anti-war, even the, you know, absolutely horrific images from Saving Private Ryan and other films, there's still something titillating about that violence or just the excitement of being so close to to even something that's horrible. Um, so I think, I think there's no clear way to draw a line between a pro-war and an anti-war film. And it, any film that calls itself anti-war is often still accused of being you know, pro-war, at least um, you know, capitalizing off of some of that spectacle. So I don't think there's a good way to do it, but you know, moving away from the spectacle of combat as uh, Professor Thompson said, I think is, is the way to do it if you can. What about Richard? I'll speak for Richard here. What about Le Carabinier? <laughs> oh, I, and I took the poster down. I have an original poster of Le Carabinier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a good, it's a good mm -hmm. R film that, yeah, that, I mean, that's a really good point. It, it, it mocks everything and it undercuts it. Oh, so it's not also, mocking. It's, it's trying to be like Mother Courage. It's like, I, you know, the, one way to think about war is that it's, it's terrible, it's tragic, it's heroic, but it's stupid. I mean, you know, that's no, that one of the points about, about Le Carabinier and Mother Courage and her children is, how could you imagine that you could benefit from sending your children to war, you know? And the same thing with Le Carabinier. How can you imagine you could have all these treasures that are laid out on postcards? I mean, so there's, it's a, it's a very arrogant kind of position, but I don't think you can, and, and there is spectacle there, but he appropriates the spectacle from existing war films. So you see footage of different wars, you know, world wars, colonial wars, and so on, as a kind of like thrown together assemblage of war, an abstract representation of war. And, you know, I mean, it does seem to me, I would also say maybe parts of Fragment of an Empire, where, you know, guy comes out of a war and he finds he's crawling through a graveyard and he sees a crucifix with Jesus on the cross, except Jesus is wearing a, a gas mask. So there are sort of poetic, you know, excursions too, I suppose, that, that get had some of that edge. Yeah. Isn't, like isn't Paris... Back to French cinema there with uh, like Grand Delusion and Godard and stuff. But okay, go ahead and talk. Yeah. I, I was going to say, isn't uh, Paths of Glory kind of like Grand Illusion in that there isn't a spectacle there before you you think pretty pretty badly about uh, military military authority after that film. It's a pretty strong anti-war film, I think. That has a very strong connection. You're exactly right, I think, and that has a strong connection to 1917 because that trench, mm -hmm. long those long trench tracking shots, was were sort of innovated by Kubrick in that film. I mean, that's the first time mm -hmm. that really got extensively exploited. But yeah, I mean, it's about military justice, and there is no justice mm -hmm. in the military. So, Mac, you've been patient. You got a question? Yes. Hello, Bordwell and Thompson. Oh, oh, sorry. I, I, am I still mute or? Yeah, we can, no, we can hear you. Go ahead. Hello. Um, my name is Mac and I've really enjoyed the talk very, so far. And from what Chuck has mentioned, I was about to say that as well. Um, 
Do you think that, um, I think it's already answered that um, Mendes had a huge inspiration from both Nolan and Kubrick, especially Paths of Glory from the tracking shot of the trench scene from Paths of Glory? Do you think that also inspired him to do the one shot take for 1917? You know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, it's such a steady cam driven movie. And you think of Kubrick, as soon as, as soon as he had a chance to use the steady cam in The Shining, he said, I'm, you know, I was made for this, you know? And coming out, as you say, uh, of Paths for Paths of Glory. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the question is, you can flip it and say, well, how else do you film people in trenches, you know? It fits the walk and talk aesthetic so well of people following around. But I guess I would say something else about that and that um, one of the things that uh, classic cinema gives us is we might say is camera ubiquity, that the, because of cutting, you can assume different positions in, on, in space. You can go from long shot to close up and come to a new angle and so on. Once you commit to this long take aesthetic, you have to think about uh, the lack of camera ubiquity you have to think about the fact that you're at any given moment, you're locked to that spot and, and, you, and you transit to another spot and to another spot and so on. So that will change how you construct the space of the film. It'll change, we always emphasize time with these long take movies, but actually space is just as important because you have to stage the action in such a way to choreograph it with the camera in such a way as in a sense to replicate the kind of storytelling information that you'd get with cutting. You have to find ways to have close-ups. You have to find ways to have over-the-shoulder shots. You have to find ways to go, to give point-of-view shots even, over-the-shoulder or absent point-of-view shots, like the shot Richard mentioned to the window of that building. And what we find in Birdman and this and other films of long take you know, disposition is that they find ways to kind of absorb classical scene construction into the long take. And that means doing things like Kubrick does as well. If you think about say, Eyes Wide Shut, where he wants to hold the take as long as he can on a dance floor. So he has people talking to each other as they dance, Nicole Kidman and I forget who she's talking to. And he simply has them rotate and shot reverse shot. He's holding the shot mm -hmm. and they just swing around, you know, whoever's speaking is favored this way, favored that way and so on. This kind of compromise in terms of your staging is sort of a, a forced choice once you decide to have the long take or indeed a, a single take film. And to me, that's a fascinating development in film history to have these directors who so even boast about having long takes or full, you know, one shot films, because it does set up a kind of sense of, well, I can recapitulate classic cutting and staging in a single take. It's kind of like, I, I, got, I got all this covered. And again, I see a kind of self-congratulatory quality to this which I do find in Kubrick as well. I mean, like, look, Ma, I'm doing this uh, a lot. And he becomes a model, I think, for young filmmakers um, mm -hmm. in the new Hollywood for that sort of reason. Yeah, that is an amazing claim. And, you know, long takes are something that I find really effective. And since we're talking about war films today, another I can think of is Full Metal Jacket with- no, um, Absolutely. And, how the shot is so symmetrical when you have people on PT jogging. And even the scene where these Marines are about to invade a city in Saigon, the, the long take of following the soldiers jogging into the building and about to gun down the building. And then Kubrick cuts, and then he goes back into a continuous take again. That's what I find. Really and they were trained for that. That's a good point. They, that, they execute what they were trained for in that, mm -hmm. that's right. You know, to think of another film, and I'd be interested in what other people think, would you say Black Hawk Down was a somewhat anti-war spectacle film? Oh. Because I, I don't think you could come out of that film and feel very virtuous about what, what was going on. I could be wrong about that. I mean, there's a spectacle, so there's a primal appeal, I agree, uh, with that, that, that there is that. But in terms of a higher order kind of thematics, you know, Maybe the, maybe the spectacle is the bait that gets you in to think about, you know, holy crap, this is a huge mistake, you know? No, it's true. No, it's a good example. Yeah, other questions. And, and nobody has to answer who milked the cow in 1917, but that's still been bugging me. But, yeah. um, but anyway, yeah, other questions yet? Yeah. We can go on for a few more minutes as long as people are interested. This is, this is, this is terrific to me. And I, again, I just want to say hi to Joseph Shin. There's so many people on here I'm thrilled to see. So. Uh, and he's got the, he wins the best back. Yeah, these are great questions. Keep them coming. Yeah, what Comments. else would be of interest? And 
I know Kristen's got another clip if we needed of the special effects and stuff. I don't know if that fits in anyway, but um, other questions? Uh, no other? Yeah, Moments of Heroism. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm and in chat, uh, Richard, there was one question in chat from uh, Joe Hildreth. He, he said in chat, between 1917 and Dunkirk, which one, in your opinion, executes the idea of it's about saving lives, not taking them better, and why? Also, do you think 1917 raises questions about the futility of war more so than Dun Dunkirk does or at all? It's question. really a question for everybody, I think. I mean, yeah. for me, I mean, the, the thing that people usually stress about Dunkirk is survival is victory. That, that it, it mitigates the idea of conquest as victory to the idea of we made it to fight again. And that seems to be so explicit at the very end of the film when uh, Alex, the, other, the guy that uh, Tommy picks up, says they're going to hate us when we come back, you know. Yeah. Uh, but actually, they don't. They say, we're glad you got through it. Uh, so that seemed and that to be given in the beginning with that map that they have, the, the Germans send out survival plus surrender. That is, to survive, you must surrender. No, you can split that. You don't have to surrender and still survive. That seems to be the thematic of that film. With 1917, I see it as a somewhat more conventional one where it's a mission-based film and the mission is accomplished. Um, they live to fight another day, so there's a survival component, but I also think it's more about the futility. I would say that emphasizes more the futility of the war because, of course, we've lost this protagonist and we get to see the effect of that protagonist's loss on his brother. Yeah, and we see these these crazy commanders, the, the Andrew yeah. Scott character and yeah. the yeah. Ben Benedict Cumberbatch character are just, you know, foul people. And yeah. Yeah. there there is, of course, a convention in war films of, you know, blaming the commanders who have sent these people into war. Uh, Charge of the Light Brigade uh, in the 60s was Attack. Sort of yeah. the ultimate example of that. But um, but that, of course, is associated with a war that everybody looks back upon as pointless. I mean, World War I didn't have to happen, and it took terrible tolls on innocent people, whereas it's pretty well assumed that World War II did have to happen. Uh, and the Vietnam terrible. films do the same thing, don't they? The Vietnam yeah. films like Apocalypse Now and Go Tell the Spartans and all those films the grunt's point of view is that these guys who are telling us what to do don't know what's going on. You know, that, another, that, another thing though in, this, in these two films is I think it, it, it's not, it, 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 it shows yeah, the horrors of film and it's pointless and, and all that to a certain extent, but it also demonizes the enemy so much, right? We never get to know anybody from the other side. Uh, they're just, right? I mean, so I, it's really hard to be sort of a anti, it, so it kind of reinforces that sort of heroism. You just, the Nazis are just plain bad. Um, so you yes. never get to humanize them the way that Grand Illusion is going to say, well, the guys on the other side are also just being forced to fight. Yeah. Um, yeah. We don't really get that impression here, I think, in either of the films. They're just, they're just a natural force almost uh, yeah. to fight against. So that's, to me, at least that undercuts in the comparative the culture war pick point about war so much as individuals in difficult situations. Yeah, in a comparative cultural context, it's fascinating. I wonder, did it... Sorry, go ahead. James Peterson? I was just going to say, I... Oh, go ahead, Chuck. Yeah. I felt like it, it, uh, in watching uh, Dunkirk the first time, I felt at the end of the film like it was an intensely nationalistic film, you know, about British, British pride and the common people helping save the British soldiers. And uh, I wonder if other people felt that too. And also, it's interesting that that film came out around the same time as those two films about Churchill, oh, yeah. which also were about, uh, at least one of them anyway, about about that that moment of Dunkirk. So I wonder if something was going on in British culture that was striving for some nationalistic fervor or something like that. Brexit. Brexit. Also about that, about the Dunkirk, but from the other standpoint, about making a film about Dunkirk, actually. Right. Yeah, so it is a different kind of heritage film all of a sudden. Yeah, uh, yeah Chris and Kenny both said, yeah, Dunkirk. Or I'm done. Those had Brexit um, as well. So, and that, um, that's why I wanted to bring up the issue of race again, because it's not like they're making films about white male heroes in a vacuum or mm -hmm. merely just because it is accurate to the history. I mean, it's part of this larger context of cultural conversations going on sure. and growing xenophobia 
and movements around white supremacy. And I'm not saying that's their intention or that that is, you know, what they are, you know, trying to sure. do in the films, but, you know, that is the context in which they were being released. And I think is an important thing sure. to consider about, you know, how, how they are representing different individuals and different identities. Good point. Yeah. Um, Richard, I don't know. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Richard, I don't know if you still are having trouble seeing the chat, but there's a couple of uh, questions on war film narrative uh, from Aaron Dorabek and also Aaron Meskin. Okay. All right, and then after that, then Jim Peterson too just came in with a data question. I was just going to follow up on, it's yeah, just Aaron. really kind of following up on direction Tanine was going. And I was going to ask David and Kristen if they could say anything, or Tanine, about these films in relation to De Five Bloods, which in some ways seems to me like much more traditional war film. They're episodic. Sure. Um, they have flashbacks. They're group focused. It's Sorry, it's group focused. Um, on the other hand, it's, you know, it's not really set during wartime, although it has the flashbacks. And it's got this radical you know, very different representation of race. Sure. So so in some ways really different, some some ways really yeah, anyway, I just I was just thinking about it and if wondering what thoughts you guys had about it. No, I think that's right. But I think that's one of the things about genres is that I won't say they're exactly hollow vessels, but you can take representations and kind of pour them into those molds. So you can have the slightly crazy guy, the sensible guy, the one who has, you know, PTSD, all that, you can have those generically co coded figures, but at the same time, you can bring in for other nuances and implications, and other thematic, you know, consequences, people of different races, people of different genders. I mean, some of the World War II films, uh, of the period, the period, the films made during World War II, about women in prison camps. So, I mean, you can pour these things into these different molds and they it's not like they're the same. They'll always have different valences, but the genres provide that structure where you can take on new thematic material, for sure. New ideo ideological material. What strikes me about 1917 and Dunkirk in relationship to De Five Bloods is that, um, the first two films are really almost lacking any kind of context whatsoever. I mean, as we talked about, they, there's no exposition. They don't talk about why they're doing this, the import of it, it's just this one mission or just these you know, different experiences that these individuals are having you know, on the beach or in the air or on, on water. Whereas De Five Bloods I think is all about context and it is more traditional in that way when you know, mm -hmm. World War II films were made to justify why we're fighting and try to get people on board with it. The Five Bloods is not, does not have that propagand propagandistic function, but it is all about the context of where these men sure. came from, how they served, where they are now, dealing with the, with the a context of current politics, having a Trump supporter and Black Lives Matter all in there. You know, so it's, it's definitely chock full of all of that stuff that I think in the, in the way that Dunkirk and 1917 are these spare kind of like art films in a way. Well, they're legacy um, pictures, aren't they? They're legacy pictures. But I mean, absolutely. you're right, I think too, in another way, and that is in a way, I hadn't thought about this, but the Five Bloods is a response to American Sniper because it's full of context too. It's full of all the stuff you were just mentioning. Yeah. It just has a different, you know, it activates a different one. Good point, okay. Um, so we will try to wrap up by 5.30. So uh, Jim Peterson, because Matthew Bernstein and Jim Peterson and I were all in grad school together with David and Kristen. Uh, Jim, you had a question I hear for the respondents. I was just wondering if you would talk for a minute about the role of uh, surprise, uh, because the war film, it seems to me, has uh, this kind of an interplay between the overall mission of the soldiers uh, and it's a little bit like horror films in that way, too. So you've got an overall objective to uh, defeat the monster or escape from the monster. But both genres have this opportunity for these sort of arbitrary surprises to pop up at you at any time. You can step on a mine or a biplane might crash on you or the monster might jump out unexpectedly from a corner. And so it seems Rats. to me both kind of a, it's part of the core experience of the war film. They have these sort of arbitrary surprises, which the filmmaker can pop out whenever, whenever he or she wants. Yep. 
it's part of what makes them episodic, I think, but it's, it, it motivates it realistically because, hey, the enemy is everywhere. But also, I think your point's well taken because when we think of the suspense structure, we tend to think it's better to not have surprise. I mean, this is the classic Hitchcock distinction between suspense and surprise. The bomb under the table that you know about, the audience knows about, is more suspenseful than the bomb the audience doesn't know about and just goes off. But the thing is, that's interesting in what you say, I think, is that this kind of balancing act is done in something like 1917. It's very, very specific, I think, because by being so restricted to what they know, we don't usually have any superior position of knowledge that would produce classic suspense. I mean, it's much more a matter of dread as they go over a hill or they're looking, you know, they go into a building, what could be there? But the beautiful example of what you're describing, I think, comes when they're in that abandoned farmhouse and they look out and the surprise moment is when the plane comes down at them, but then it dips below the horizon and you think, oh, whew, it's gonna be okay. So, but then it holds on the horizon and that's the moment of suspense and the plane comes back up again. And then the suspense kicks in. The moment of surprise is ratcheted into a flow of suspense. But your point is well taken. I think of the war film, part of what keeps it going, the energy that keeps it going is the sniper that knights off your buddy, you know, just like that or the bomb that comes from nowhere, as you say, the landmine, all those things are, are part of the episodic quality I think we associate with war films. You just can't predict what's gonna happen next. Yeah, thinking of, again, of Saving Private Ryan, you've got a mission to find this guy and it takes him a long time. Um, and what are you gonna do in the meantime? You can't just watch them wandering around the countryside you know, looking for Private Ryan, uh, they've got to, suddenly run into uh, a village that's been um, defeated, a French village, and the two parents try to give the little girl to the soldiers for some, you know, to apparently get her to safety. And, you know, things like that just pop out at them and, and end up with whole episodes. And of course, the Vin Diesel character dies as a result of, of accepting the little girl. So I, I think surprise is there because you can't just watch them, you know, yeah. trying to find a guy. You've got to have some kind of generation of, of action. Well, I drew the comparison to the horror film too, because one of the things that um, there's a kind of an interplay with surprise and, and suspense and dread, because you're going to often you have to look at something really grotesque and horrible. So you see something, somebody bodily slash or cut up in a horror film or blown up. There's this sort of anxiety about having to look at something truly grisly at any moment where you don't know where it's coming from. The, tr the traditional combat film is defined by a modulation between moments of action and moments without action, you know, sort of thinking about no, what we're doing or traveling or doing roll call or relationships or meeting girls or whatever, and then moments of action. What strikes me about these two newer movies, 1917 and Dunkirk, is that you don't have that. It's really kind of nonstop action. And in that way, it really reminded me of video games, which, you know, it's nonstop action until either you die and have to start over or until there's maybe a brief cut scene to get you ready for the next nonstop action. So um, that, that's really the distinction that I, that I see between the, the two. But I would go to say that there are film prototypes before video games. I mean, one of the things that sure. inspired Dunkirk was uh, Wages of Fear, the Clouseau film. And once the premises are laid out, there really aren't much, isn't much downtime in that movie. I mean, that's pretty much suspenseful all the way. And I, again, I would go to speed and the whole idea of the continuous, act, or what's the one, the, the Johnny Depp movie, uh, not Vanishing Point, though that's a good example too. But I mean, there are films where- Nick of time. Nick of time, exactly, thank yeah. you. Uh, where it's just like one arc, you know? So in the 90s, you start to get films, even before video games become really popular, really highly crafted, that have the same thing. And probably there's an interplay between people seeing video games and inspired by them, but people also seeing films and deciding video games can go this way too. I don't know, but yeah, I mean, I do think you're right to say that the classic, classic film does have that interruptive structure of downtime, which allows for interesting things like characterization, ideology, all that stuff that, we think of as part of you know part of the discourse around a war film well we got to wrap up in a couple of minutes um mac do you have a short question yeah it's a short comment for uh tanine on 1917 
Um, Tanine, that was a, a really interesting point about 1917 and war video games. And I think it's a really great point because if you see how 1917 is filmed, it's like you see a lot of the back of the characters and it's kind of like, you know, when you play a video game, it's like, you know, you're following these characters and you only see their back. And I think that's a really great point. And some critics in, you know, when they were seeing 1917, they even compared it to some of the video games that they played as well. But I would also say, I mean, one of the things about this camera ubiquity thing is that if you're a filmmaker, you have to find ways to vary that. I mean, you don't want a whole movie where you're just following your characters. Although, I mean, Bellatar kind of did it with Satan's Tango. But the thing is, there's a way in which you have to finesse moments that can motivate the characters arcing around. Are you, I mean, there's some impossible things. If you think of the camera as a body, as some people tend to do, there are things that this camera does that no body can do. You know, they go through solid surfaces and things like that. I mean, it's really camera ubiquity to the next level. And so sometimes they have to walk towards us in the classic walk and talk because we need to see their faces as they're expressing emotion as they have the dialogue. I mean, so the, back, the backward view is there, but I think it's a part of a larger dynamic of front, back, sideways, and so on. What you don't tend to get is the God's point of view, the godly point of view. You're, you're fairly attached to the characters on their level or a little lower sometimes or a little higher sometimes, but you're never really floating above them, you know, in a big sort of... Uh, a uh, crane shot or something like that. That's where you're more restricted. You have it sometimes, but but by and large not. So the that's again, the task of the filmmaker, if you're gonna to commit to this somewhat crazy idea of a single shot movie, uh, you've gotta find these ways to finesse it to make it still intelligible. That's true, you don't, have a, you don't have a pilot up above like you do in Dunkirk, so you can get those beautiful shots of hundreds of people or yeah, as no, well. No yeah, drone, no, right. I don't think there are any drone shots. But then, again, if you Deep, look at the commentary, the, ground, the, the cinematographers are always talking about how they passed it along. I mean, this was a grip movie, basically, because the camera's being passed from one camera support to another to another. It's on a dolly, and then it's on handheld, and then it's on a, a blimp or something, and it just takes off around the corner and stuff. So there's all these kinds of um, complicated rigs that carry the camera and still supposedly imitating the human body. Nah. <laughs> and I would, I would strongly recommend to anybody who hasn't looked at them, American Cinematographer is online. If you just do American Cinematographer Dunkirk, American Cinematographer 1917, you get those great pictures of like a bunch of men in like this little hole that's supposed to, you know, uh, if, of a trench. It's not like some long thing and how they, but it, it's just really interesting, yeah, to see, to see the different kinds of camera support systems they had uh, as well. Well, we should wrap up. I'm just really thrilled not only to get like, I've actually seen some students' faces here I've never actually seen in class because they're just black boxes always. Um, so it's good to see students, but also people from other institutions. Uh, Chuck Milan, really thank you very much for, for joining us as well. Um, so to see good friends and, uh, and everybody together, but it's a really, really a, tr a treat to talk with David and Chris again. Uh, just to hear their voices and, and thoughts always is marvelous. So, so thank you everybody for doing this. We really appreciate it. Thanks Dave Maher and the Wilson Center for over 20 years now of round tables and discussions. So thanks very much. Uh, I'll stick around if anybody has any questions, but otherwise um, till next semester. And again, thanks to David and Kristen for doing this. <laughs>